Does it sometimes look like your flash is firing twice every time you take a picture? That's actually a feature and not a bug. Let's talk about pre-flash on today's episode of... Ask David Bergman! Hey there everybody, welcome back. Here I am, as always, answering your photography questions right here on Adorama TV. Today's question comes from Dennis G and he wants to know, when I take a picture using off-camera flash, it seems to fire twice. Why is that? It's a good question, Dennis, and thanks so much for sending it in. First of all, you're not going crazy. Yes, there are times when your flash actually fires twice in rapid succession. And there are two reasons why this could happen. The first one has to do with TTL metering in your camera. To understand what's actually happening, let's go through some history of flash technology. Now, before we had today's fancy metering systems, the camera's flash was relatively simple, and photographers were basically guessing to get their exposure just right. You had guide numbers, distance charts, and a whole lot of trial and error. If you wanted proper exposure, you had to calculate your settings based on the power of your flash, the sensitivity of your film, and the exact distance to your subject. Then you did the math in your head, or you carried around a little chart. It worked, but it was challenging. If the subject moved closer or further away, or if the scene was unusually bright or dark, you had to make new calculations or risk a badly exposed photo. Eventually, the camera manufacturers came up with a pretty smart idea. They put a sensor directly on the flash itself. Using the auto or A mode, you would set your aperture and ISO on both the camera and the flash. When you press the shutter, the flash would begin to fire and that sensor would see the light bouncing back from the scene. As soon as it detected enough light, the flash would cut itself off mid-burst. Obviously, this was happening incredibly fast, but it was pretty cool because the flash could actually adjust its output on the fly. However, it was far from perfect. Since the sensor was on the flash and not in the camera, it was making decisions based only on the light that came back directly to that flash. If you had it pointed straight at your subject, it generally worked pretty well. But as soon as you started bouncing the light off a wall or you put your flash in a modifier like a photo umbrella, the geometry changed and the results could be inconsistent. And if you were using multiple flashes, you were probably better off just shooting in manual. Then came TTL flash metering, which stands for through the lens, TTL. This meant that the camera could actually measure the flash exposure in real time by reading the light that reflected off the film during the exposure. It was seeing the light from the whole scene, not just measuring each flash individually. Now, unlike the old auto mode, it didn't matter if you used multiple flashes, bounce the light, zoom the flash head, or even put a filter on the lens. The system was measuring what the camera saw through the lens, so it was much more accurate and flexible. That made it a real game changer, especially as flashes became more sophisticated and photographers started using multiple lights off camera. But that was not the end of the story. As flash systems got more advanced, Canon and other manufacturers started adding new tricks to improve accuracy, and that's where pre-flash first appeared. In 1986, Canon introduced their ATTL technology on the T90. In full program mode, ATTL added a brief pre-flash before the exposure began. The camera would trigger a very short, low power burst of light while it was metering. Depending on the flash, it could be an infrared pulse or a faint white burst. The sensor on the flash measured the light that came back from the pre-flash, and the camera used that information to set a balanced combination of aperture and shutter speed. But that was just for the overall exposure. The actual flash exposure itself was still controlled in real time by the sensor built into the flash, not through the lens. Just like the older auto mode without pre-flash, if you bounced the light, added a modifier, or used a filter, the system could be fooled. It gave the camera a little extra info, but it wasn't yet a true through the lens flash metering solution. Then in 1995, Canon introduced their ETTL. This was the real turning point. Instead of just setting overall exposure, ETTL used a pre-flash to actually determine the flash exposure itself. The pre-flash pre had a set level, like maybe something low like 1 of a power. Um, so when the camera measured the return through the lens with its ambient light sensor, it could see how bright or dark the scene looked at that setting. If the meter showed the pre-flash was underexposed by two stops, the, sy the system simply told the flash to fire the main burst at two stops more power. All of that math happened in the split second between that free flash, between the pre-flash and the real exposure. Now, Canon refined their system in 2004 with ETTL 
2, which improved consistency by adding distance information from the lens and ignoring highly, reflected, highly reflective areas that could throw off the reading. Now, other camera brands followed in a similar path. Nikon moved from their film-based TTL to DTTL in 1999, and then introduced ITTL in 2003, which also relied on pre-flashes. Sony, Pentax, and Fujifilm developed their own versions around the same time, and they all worked pretty much the same way. Hey, before I go on, do me a favor and hit that like button, subscribe to the Adorama YouTube channel if you haven't already, and go ahead and tap that bell icon so you get notified when new episodes go live. It really does help us out and let us know you want more free educational videos from me and all the other photo hosts here on Adorama TV. Also, you probably know by now, if you've got your own photography question you want me to answer, just go to askdavidbergman.com, fill out the form on that site, and I just might pick your question to answer here on a future show. Okay, so that brings us to today. TTL used to only be found in small speed lights, but it's so popular that you'll see it built into many pro studio strobes too. It's great technology that can get you accurate flash exposures, even with complicated setups, because it's metering what the camera is actually seeing through the lens. However, there are some downsides. The first one is that those pre-flashes can sometimes cause subjects to blink right before the actual exposure. If you're photographing someone who's particularly sensitive to light and they close their eyes during the pre-flash, you might get half-open eyes in your picture. It's not so much an issue for me personally because I never photograph someone with direct, unmodified flash on camera. In a run and gun situation, like say backstage at a concert where I'm moving around a lot, I'll usually bounce my flash off the ceiling. The rest of the time, I've got the flash in some kind of a modifier and preferably off camera. In those cases, blinking is usually less of a problem because the light feels softer and less harsh to your subject. It also takes, I also try to take bursts of images whenever possible, so that virtually guarantees I'll get frames where everyone's eyes are all wide open. Another issue with pre-flash is when you want to optically trigger other strobes, like when you're mixing different brands of flash. One of the benefits of sticking with one brand of flash is that they're made to talk to each other, so they understand what's happening with the pre-flash and work seamlessly. But if you're using different brands of flash at the same time, they might not be able to understand what the others are doing. I'm going to post a link at the end of this video to one that I did a few years ago about how to mix and match flash brands, but one way to do it is to use optical triggers. The basic concept is that a receiver fires as soon as it sees the light from another flash. If you're shooting TTL, the pre-flash will actually trigger those strobes too early and they probably won't recycle fast enough to fire again for the actual exposure. It can be confusing at first because you'll see all your flashes firing, but they won't actually show up in your image. You'll keep turning up the power and still get nothing. That's because the pre-flash is screwing you up there. Some third-party systems and triggers actually have a mode to ignore the pre-flash. Godox and Flashpoint, for example, have S1 and S2. S1 is just the regular optical trigger mode, while S2 ignores the pre-flash and fires on the second pop only. And not all systems have these options, so check your manual to make sure yours does. If they don't, I'd recommend you turn off TTL and just work in manual so that the flash only fires once. In a pinch, you can use the flash exposure lock function, or FEL. When you push the FEL button on your camera, it, goes, it fires a pre-flash to determine the exposure like normal. But then you've got, in the case of many Canon cameras, 16 seconds or so to take the picture using the flash exposure that's now locked in memory. FEL is normally used to get an exposure and then recompose your shot in a way that might have been inaccurate using TTL. But since you can wait a bit to take the picture, you can give your other strobes enough time to recycle after the pre-flash. You also won't have to worry much about anyone blinking when there's that much time between pre-flash and main flash. Keep in mind that you'll have to do this for every single image, so that's a lot of extra flashes. But it's a good way to go if you don't have any other option and you just don't want to shoot on manual for some reason. Okay, so finally, if you remember way back in the beginning, I said there are two reasons why Dennis might be seeing multiple flashes when taking a picture. Many cameras also have a red eye reduction feature. You've probably taken a photo where someone's eyes went completely red instead of their natural color. Red eye can happen when your flash is close to your lens, like with a pop-up flash or a point and shoot that has one built in. If the angle is just right, the light is gonna hit your subject and reflect off the blood vessels behind their retina. That's why it turns red. 
It's even more pronounced in low light when your subject's pupils are dilated. The more open they are, the more red you're gonna see. So the camera's red eye reduction feature works by firing a more obvious burst or a series of pulses before the real picture. The idea is to make your subject's pupils contract so the main flash is less likely to reflect off the back of their eye. It's just got a smaller area, so there's gonna be a much smaller area that's red and you have less chance of seeing that red eye. Now this is totally separate from the TTL pre-flash. That's much faster and isn't nearly enough time for your eyes to adjust. Red eye reduction happens earlier and is really easy to see. In most cases, you have to enable it in your settings, so look for it in your menus if you want to turn it off. There's really no reason to use red eye reduction if you're bouncing the flash or using off-camera light where red eye is not going to be a problem. So. There you have it. What do you all think? Do you, did you know about the TTL pre-flash? Has it ever ruined a shot like causing blinks or triggering other strobes too early? Let me know your experience down in the comments. As promised, here's the video I did a number of years ago about the many different ways you can trigger flashes if you're mixing and matching different brands. Thanks so much for watching Adorama TV. I'll see you next time right here on Ask David Burton.